Good morning. I hope everybody's having a great morning this fine morning. I hope maybe getting some rain. My name is Trace Kirkwood. I work here at Kentucky Department for Libraries and Archives. I'm the manager of the Local Records Program, uh, which is a program that is funded by the Kentucky County Clerks that allows us to help all agencies of county government, including libraries, make decisions about records management and, uh, and also um, with the preservation of records. So that's my primary job. <clears throat> but I, I come to the records management world as a former curator. I used to be a curator at the Filson Historical Society in Louisville. I was the, held that position for seven and a half years. So I, I kind of have a different approach to the world of archives. Uh, if you don't know, there's records management side of archives, and there's then there is also the historical preservation side of archives. And I live in both worlds. And what that has enabled me to do throughout the years is to become very adept at doing local research using county court rec or uh, county clerk records and the various courthouses, circuit court records, and the records that are here at the uh, Department for Libraries and Archives. So. Uh, my goal this morning is to share with you my knowledge. I won't dare call it expertise because I know people who can do this far better than I can. But the uh, I do I have been through courthouses so often that I know these records very well. I think I yesterday or I mean last week, last Friday, I went to uh, Trimble County Courthouse. I think that was courthouse number 87 for me. So 87 out of the 120 courthouses I've been in. Uh, Valerie, Valerie Edgeworth is here with me. She's my producer, director, uh, the one that's going to try to keep me on track, which is hard to do. Um, so if you have any questions, I think you can, you can chat with her. I'll try to chat with you. Uh, but, you know, I, I tend to get rolling and don't stop. So my presentation is called Every Hedgerow Has a History, Using Archives to Discover Local Heritage. The way I came up with that title is because I... For several years, I worked for a consulting firm that did archaeological digs, and my job was to research the history of the sites that they found. And in that job, in the, the few years that I had that job, I started to see the landscape in a different way. Um, and that enables me, has tuned my eye to seeing things in a way that other people don't see them. I see old roads where people see subdivisions. Uh, for instance, in this one, the, the slide that I have up now is Chamberlain Lane in Louisville. Uh, you can see on the bottom of that slide, there's the Jefferson Free, or, I'm sorry, the Snyder Freeway. I'm an old Louisvillian, so I still call it by the old name. Uh, Chamberlain Lane used to take a different trajectory through there, and on the next slide you'll see the red line shows the way it used to go. So those people in those houses the snug little houses in the subdivision of Louisville don't realize that there is an old road that goes right through their backyard. And uh, these types of landscape features are all over the place throughout Kentucky. This slide is taken from Google Earth. This is uh, Russellville Road at the, in uh, Warren County at the point where Warren, Logan, and Simpson counties come together. And uh, well, it just looks like an aerial photograph of a highway and an old road. There's actually more, much more to this slide. You can see what I've highlighted there in red. Uh, I'll run the arrow along it in case you don't see it. The uh, all along through here is a very old road. Up here, you have the modern four-lane US 68 State Road 80 that goes through western Kentucky. Here you have the old US 68 uh, and then the red line is the original road to the area and I, I have not put a lot of research into this but I do know that just by the layout of it that is the the original road that the settlers probably used and it probably dates back to the, the buffalo migrating through the area and there are Part of the road is still used, but out in the field up in this area, all that's the remnants of the road is a swale that goes through the field. So this brings me to Shelby County, uh, where I live now. And uh, 
Shortly after we moved to Shelby County, I live in, I gotta find it, I live right around this area. Well, I killed my, I live, my house sits right about there. Uh, there's a trail system that the, the uh, Shelby County has made that basically embarks from my house onto a whole network of, of trails. So when we moved there, I would walk with my children through through that trail system, and I noticed a, a, a hedgerow that caught my eye, and I thought it was a peculiar kind of hedgerow. And at some point, the trail intersected with it, and I noticed that it had a slight swale in it, so it got my curiosity going. And what it turns out, where you can see the red line that I have highlighted there, is the a con, a almost continuous hedgerow. It goes through part of a subdivision, just like what I showed you earlier, and then it intersects with an old road, an old turnpike called Burke's Branch Road, and then it goes off at an odd angle. Uh, it was the odd angle of this hedgerow. It's not consistent with the other hedgerows in the area that caught my eye. Now this is a closer look at it. The hedgerow goes, there it is in the subdivision. Here it is through, going through a farm field. Uh, and then this is the bypass around Shelbyville right here. And then the hedge continues going through people's backyards. Uh, this is a little different view of it. You see that I have it highlighted there. And then this is kind of the northern end of it. This tree line right through here is the, the continuation of that hedge. So uh, this is the question I ask. What the heck? What the heck is that? And wh when these questions come up, when, when they were presented to me when I worked for cultural resource analyst in uh, Lexington, this is the questions that I came up with. Where do I start? Who do I contact? Where do I go? To find who, what, when, why, and how many. Uh, these things were always mysteries. They would uh, do test probes and find historic artifacts. Now, if they found arrowheads and stuff like that, it was way beyond my expertise. So I wasn't, I didn't work on those projects. But if they found historic artifacts, meaning something that postdated the settlement period of Kentucky and wasn't associated with Native Americans, then that's when I came in to, to, to do the research. And that was my assignment was to figure out that last line, who, what, when, why, and how many. And there is a way to do that. Uh, and, and the way I would go about this is I, I would know where the location of the, of the site was. And in the case of this hedge in Shelby County, I know, I'm, you know, obviously I knew where the location. So you start, in order to do this type of research, you start with a property valuation administrator. You can talk either the shorthand for them or PVA. And almost every PVA office well, every PVA office I've ever been into has a map on the wall or they have it sitting out on a desk um, that has the various map tracks of the county on it. And this, this is a photo I took in the PVA office in Shelby County, and you can see the different colors. So you go to that map and you figure out which track map you need to look at. Um, <clears throat> you can see here, you start with the map of the county, identify the track number, uh, you use that track map to identify the track number. The track number will have references to a property card. And the property card, if you, uh, I'm going to go back to that previous slide. The black filing cabinets, uh, let me go through this. Use the, the map, let me get my pointer. Use this map to find the, the plat, I mean the, the map number. Pull out the plat number from the plat cabinet, uh, and that will identify the various tracks that are in the, on that particular map. And, and they have a number, and then you use that number to look up the property card and the filing cabinets that are next to it. Uh, it's a three-step process, and every time it's a three-step process, there's no shortcuts on that. Uh, once you get the property card, that's going to provide you the name of the current owner, and hopefully, and in most cases, of the deed book and page number of the latest deed that's been filed on that piece of property. 
And when you're looking at these property cards, you can either photocopy them if you want to. If you don't, make plenty of notes off that property card. Uh, that, that, is a, it, that is very critical to doing this research. So I'm going to share with you um, an example of the notes that I made while I was in the uh, PVA office. These are my, th this is a PDF, let me, I'm going to go back up to the top, PDF of the, uh, of the notes I made right there in the Shelby County Clerk's Office. You can see Shelby, and I, I structure my notes so that I, when I ref refer to them later, I know what the heck I'm looking at. So you can see Shelby PVA office. I looked at map 40AB, and on map 40AB, I looked at uh, parcel 62A, and I wrote a note there just west of the hedge line. I mean, it is just to the west of the hedge line that I'm, that I'm trying to solve. I'm trying to figure out what the heck that hedge line is. And then I also made notes on parcel 67A through F. I really wrote a little note out there. 67F is the church at Burke's Branch and Freedom Way, FW. That's Freedom Way. That's the bypass around Shelbyville. And I also made a, uh, a note 67E adjoins hedge. If I scroll down through here, you can see I'm, I'm a map person. I think via maps. So I actually drew out the, I use the, the, this number here, uh, 040-00-62A is was taken from the property card. I know that it's a 43.63 acre track and it's held by Her Heritage Legacy. There are several deeds on 20, deeds from 2014, uh, two, two, one from 2013, one from 2003, 1978. That's the earliest deed I found on the tract of land. You see, I drew it out and even put a little diagram of the where Freedom's Way goes bisects that particular tract of land. So my target becomes that deed right there, deed book 201, page 557. A lot of that is my shorthand, uh, but that's that's the, that's that's my target. And I knew I also could determine that that. Parcel was sold to Heritage Legacy by a gentleman named J.T. McGinnis. While I was in the PVA office, I looked at several other tracts of land, and each one I made a little diagram. The the dot this diagram, for instance, shows a tract of land. Of course, none of this is to scale. These are just rough drawings that I did while I was in in the office. The the broken line is how the hedge bisects that piece of property. That becomes critical later in doing the research, so you know where things lie. And you can see there's several, I have several different ones that I diagrammed. Uh, if, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, I was doing this work specifically for uh, a presentation I was doing here at Libraries and Archives back in June. So if I was doing this if I was going to write something about this, or if I was doing this for an employer that needed all this information, I would have researched each and every one of these tracks. I would have run the deed back on all of them. But the fact that I was just doing this so I could teach people how to do it, I chose one. And the one I chose was the, the first one I pointed out to you. And I'll tell you, I was real lucky. This is the one I chose, the, the what I called the 62A track. Uh, and I, I was very lucky because I was I was able to run the title back on this and make a connection. I found my answer by running the, the title back on this particular tract, which is really lucky because sometimes you have to research five or six tracts before you really get to the to the answer that you're looking for. So that's PVA. That when you get the information from the PVA office, your next stop is the county clerk's office, and you're already armed with a um, a deed book number and a page number. That's good. If you didn't have that, if you weren't able to discern that in the PVA office, then you would have to find that in the county clerk's office. And somehow you're going to have to come up with a name of the owner of that property. And like I said, sometimes the PVA might identify the owner, but not 
provide deed book and page number. So the way you go around that is you go to the indexes in the county clerk's office. Now most county clerk's offices in Kentucky, or well, all of them, have an electronic index. That it varies how far back that it, that electronic index goes. They some of them might only go back to the early 1970s, which satisfies most of the, of the title searches that have to be done, which only have to be looked back for 30 years. Uh, but some of them have a comprehensive electronic index. When you're in the office, you have to you have to make the decision if if that's the case with that particular office. If they don't, then you have to go to the index books. And there's different types of these. Grantor, grantee indexes. Grantor is somebody who is selling the land. A grantee is somebody who is receiving the land in the in that purchase. So if you know who uh, if you know who has a tract of land, then you want to go to the uh, the grantee index to see when they received that land. Uh, then then some when you start running title back, you're you're, you're going to latch into either one of those books, grantee, grantor. Some some offices mercifully have general cross indexes, <laughs> which are much easier to use. You because you just use one index. And you look for to make the within that index, you're looking to see if they're the grantor or the grantee. I hope you're all keeping all that straight. That, that's a lot of that's a lot of professional lingo there. I mean, basically, it comes down to who bought it, who sold it. I told them my little trick in the chat box: grantee pays the fee. That's how I was <laughs> that's taught. A, that's, yeah, that's true. Grantee pays the fee. That's how I was taught. <laughs> so, within the county clerk's office. The, uh, the real estate records for for this type of research, the real estate records are the backbone of this research. It, it's, it, it is what ties everything together. It's what gives you the path to go into the past to figure out what was going on at a particular time. Because the land obviously never moves. The configuration of the ownership often changes, but for the most part, uh, because surveying is so expensive, you have you can go into and that, that tract of land holds a lot of the same shape, particularly along its hedgerows along the edges of it, and uh, that becomes that becomes very important. It's not this is not type of researcher that you can glance through when you when you get into property descriptions and and within a deed you really have to concentrate on what they're saying. Unfortunately for the state of Kentucky. We have the meets and bounds system. The meets and bounds system is something that we inherited from Virginia, and from they who they inherited from England, and it is a nightmarish way to manage land. Uh, the The property descriptions are usually inaccurate. They're difficult to just to figure out what they're trying to to convey to the the purchaser of the land, and um, it, it's just. They can be very difficult to read. The other shortcoming of it is when you get into older deeds, they will run something 16 poles to the blue ash at the corner of the of so and so's pasture. Well, that blue ash tree was struck by lightning decades ago, so it's not there anymore. They didn't set pins or anything like that in these in these surveys in these surveys like they do today. Uh, so it, it becomes very difficult. These are the types of records that you're, you'll want to look for. Deed books, that's the number one thing. I use deed books more than anything else when I do this research. Uh, like I said, they, they are the absolute backbone of, of this type of research. The ribs, so to speak, commissioner's deeds book, commissioner's deed book. Um, that is if land went into foreclosure and was sold in the courthouse steps. The commissioner of the circuit court was the one who did the sale. And he's the one who signs the deed over to the person person doing the purchase. Surveyors' books, if they exist, are a wonderful wonderful resource because they will show you how the land was configured, how the, the ownership of the land was configured at a particular time. It gives you a snapshot. I love find sur finding surveyors' books in courthouses. Uh, they're a, a wonderful resource. Mortgage books, yeah, I don't really use mortgage books that much. Uh, they are a permanent record. They do sometimes have property descriptions. 
uh, they can add a little bit of information to the transaction of a, of a piece of property, but that's not usually what I'm looking for. Right away books, another wonderful resource, and uh, some people call these road books. A right of, but a right of way can be for a road, pipeline, power line, whatever. Uh, it, but it demonstrates how a an exception to a piece of land was, you know, how how they carved out a strip across a piece of land to run some sort of utility across it. In a drainage book, now. I know there's some folks out there in West Kentucky that are listening to this this morning. At least I hope so. These are pretty common in West Kentucky because the, the land is different from the mountains and the bluegrass. They actually went in and dug ditches and canals to better drain land so that they could farm it. Uh, the local slang for these books are called ditch books. Uh, and watch how you say that when you go into a county clerk's office. Make sure you pronounce your D very plainly. Uh, <laughs> they, uh, a, a drainage book will show you th they're a wonderful resource if you're if you're looking for a track trying to do research on a tract of land that has been where a, an old creek or something like that has been channelized because they even have sometimes have hand drawn diagrams about where the the creek was where the ditch was going and they will also sometimes mercifully put in a diagram of a house that sits nearby uh, not always. This is all this research is hit and miss. It can be terribly frustrating at times. Uh, but deed books, like I said, these things are the, these are the backbone. This is what I want when I go into a, a, a clerk's office. Uh, I'm looking primarily in a deed book for the property description and then the chain of title. Like I said, if you were lucky enough to have the deed book and page number. From the PVA office, you can skip going to those indexes and go right to running the title back through the deed books. And in a deed book, there's something called a chain of title. And when you when you usually it's within the property description at the end of the property description of a deed, it'll have the title chain. And I think I have an example of this in a pod. Let me see if I can if I can find it. Oh. This one is a little hard to read, but you can see down here. Let me get my arrow. With a sentence that starts with being. Being the same property conveyed to the first party, Melvin Sams Jr., by deed from Betty Agnes Burton, widow et al., dated October 4, 1947, and recorded in the Shelby County Clerk's Office in Deed Book 129, page 235. So that page came from, at the top, you can see where I wrote on my notes, Shelby County, Deed Book 157, page 219, 4th of February, 1964. Uh, just on that little sentence by itself, you're skipping 30-some-odd page, 30-some-odd 30, 30 deed books and going back from 1964 to 1947. Um, you know, so in this case, you know, I was able to get back to 1947 pretty quickly and was able to discern that the, the property had not changed very much at all. So that's the, that's a chain of title. Very important to this research. Um, excuse me. I think there's a couple things I want to show you all from, from that, from my work at the county clerk's office. Yeah, here, this is some of the examples. I'm going to expand this a little bit for you so you can see it better. Uh, these are my notes. You can see across the top up there, I keep losing my pointer. You can see I wrote the track number. I, the acreage is always important. I always write it down, 43.63 acres. And you can see deed book 201557. That was the one I got from the PBA office. I, and I, I used the chain of title to go back. You see deed book 441. You, you see I keep going back and I make notes about the what I found. Uh, for instance, right here where the McGinnis family had it. <clears throat> I 
I felt like this reference was pretty important. Corner of the original McGinnis Farm to McCarthy, east side of Shelbyville and Smithfield Turnpike. If you're familiar with Shelby County, that's Highway 53 today. Runs over the, almost the exact same ground. And he picked up a will reference. That's always important because sometimes these these are, are estates and probated. Um, so you have to know the... the uh, the settlement will often tell you where the probate record where it went back into the deed book, usually maybe through an affidavit of descent or something like that, which wasn't the case here. Uh, so one of the ones that caught my eye because we're de we're on this hedge is east of the of Highway 53 in Shelby County. So it's e when I saw the 52.70 acres east side Shelbyville and Smithfield Turnpike. I knew I was approximately in the right area. Like I said, there's, sometimes there's a lot of guesswork uh, <clears throat> in this type of research. But what I was looking for is some reference to that uh, to that hedge. I wanted to know what the hedge was. And in this particular one, you see in the property description, I just wrote some rough notes out here. To a stone in east side of the railroad, thence with the same south 10 west 12 poles to a point on said railroad in middle of branch well uh that's i felt like that was probably my hedge right there so so that the hedge that i showed you in those earlier slides is the remnants of an old railroad there's no, nothing today to indicate that it, it's a railroad but uh, you can see i'm scrolling through this and you can see i kept i continued to run the track back and every time it referred to uh, I would you know in this one here I put same reference to railroad and branch the branch turned out to be a little creek in the, on the trail system walking walking the trail system where where the trail intersected with the, the that hedge it was a very low area in and I believe that it was a former used to be a creek but all the development around it has wiped out the creek so um, I, I felt like I was right on where I needed to be uh, and you can see at the top it's critical when you're doing this work to keep the all your information straight so when I would start another sheet I would put 62a research continued that's that track 62a uh, and, I, I, and w once I saw the reference to the railroad, I stayed on that track. I, uh, I searched it back as far as I possibly could. Now, at some point, the, uh, the, the use of a chain, a tile chain or chain of title uh, started really around the start of the 20th century. So when you get into 19th century records, you're not going to have that convenience of having a title chain where it's going to make a reference to an earlier deed. That's when you'll ha you have to go back to the indexes that I mentioned earlier, grantor, grantee, uh, and that's usually the case for 19th century records. It's going to be grantor, grantee indexes. Very few counties at that time used a, uh, a, cross, uh, a cross reference index. So you just have to kind of File through them. Uh, this one, you can see I made a note to myself to copy the deed at KDLA because I get free copies at KDLA. <laughs> but the uh, this one really caught my eye. Certain tract of land in Shelby County on the Burks Branch Turnpike, beginning at a stone on the west side of said pike to corner of Colonel Broadhead, east side of railroad. Uh, I made a rough sketch of from the property description. And I, that is my hedge. I knew I had it right there with this, with this particular deed. Uh, it was critical to solving the case of that hedgerow. Uh, and some of the other stuff. These, these are well. This is where you can see where I've gone into the index here. You can see here. I wrote down it was out of index number five, and I started running that you know looking for that tract of land and I, this is an april 13th 1863 deed 
Thomason to James V. Boyd. It's in deed book H-2, number or page 424. Uh, and then that reference is to another part of the land that was sold to the Thomason, who was the uh, Grand Tour. So uh, I, I felt like I was right on, and it turned out I was right on. I knew exactly where that that hedge, what that hedge was. It was a railroad, and that at some point James V. Boyd owned that track that I had been researching. And it, and it turns out he's all over the, the indexes in Shelby County. Now, I'm going to show you something at, about Mr. Boyd. When you find, when you, when you decide that you have found the person you're looking for, now remember that, that deed was transferred to him in 1863. So, I checked the 1860 census. I did not find James V. Boyd in it. But I did find him in the 1870 census. And here he is. They actually had him as James N. Boyd, but they, um, I don't know why they had him like that. But I was able to discern that I was working with James V. Boyd. I, I mean, that they were actually talking to James V. Boyd. And you can see in 1870, he was 34 years old, male, white, farmer. Uh, his uh, real estate value was $2,800. He's a native of Kentucky. His wife, Eliza, a boy named William, another boy named James S., Emma Boyd, and he had living with him a 26-year-old stock trader. Uh, so that that's my guy right there. Uh, and I had, remember, I saw on the deed, one of those deeds, where there was somebody named Broadhead. Um, so I, and he was listed as John C. Broadhead in some of the other records that I found. So this is John C. Broadhead. In 1870, he was living in Louisville. There he is, 43 years old, male, white, a civil engineer. His real estate value was $20,000, and his uh, personal property value was $10,000. That's a substantial amount of money for 1870. His wife was Betty, uh, and Willie, and Eliza, his children, and a lady named Belle Gamaway, 19 years old, and she was a dem domestic servant, and she was from China. Uh, you know, just kind of curious. That, but that guy, that's... I'm, at this point, I felt pretty confident that there's the same guy that was out in Shelby County uh, <clears throat> later on. And I'll demonstrate to you why that name caught my eye in, in, a, in a minute or two. So let me hide these notes. I think we're done with those notes. I might come back to those notes. Let me get back on my slides here. Uh, I talked a little bit about probate records. This A probate record is when somebody passes away. They, if they have a written will, uh, it appoints a guard, an executor, or an executor then can appoint a guardian. Um, and then it went through an inventory process. That's where they came in and looked at the, the uh, people chosen by the executor or the guardian. A committee would come in and inventory everything that, was belong, that belonged to that person. And then after the estate was settled, they would sometimes auction off the inventory. And they would make a record of the sale of the of the belongings of that person, list what what items were sold and how much they sold for, and within that inventory, they would list the slaves if they had any slaves. I'm not dealing with that in this situation because obviously we're past the Civil War in in my research. Uh, but that is for your, your own edification. And then when they made a settlement, they would, um, they would have a settlement in the, um, in the county order book that would demonstrate that the estate was settled. And then if the property changed hands through the family, if it was spelled out in the will, then they would create an affidavit of dissent. It's a different way to transfer property so when you're running title back, you have to look for those affidavits of dissent. 
And uh, sometimes families would not do that. They wouldn't. They would just pass the property on to one another, and it becomes a, a big problem, especially doing research. But usually, it ends up in a big legal squabble for the family. Uh, these are the types of records that can be tapped into here at the Kentucky Department for Libraries and Archives. And the advantage of this, obviously, the first one I have up there are the county clerk records. Uh, we have we have some of their original records, very few for county clerks here. Uh, most of the, the original records are in the county clerk's offices. But here at Libraries and Archives, we have security microfilm of most of all the deed books for every county. The advantage of that when I was doing research for a living was that instead of scurrying all over the state like I sometimes had to do, I could come to libraries and archives and really pretty much stay in one spot and run title back by using microfilm. I had to decide if it was uh, if it was time saving to do that or you know if it was the Shelby County Courthouse, I could be there in five minutes and run and go through the books much more quickly than going through microfilm. Uh, you can go through the books really fast if you know what you're doing. Uh, microfilm, that's slow. I mean, really, security, we, we, we microfilm in order to protect records in case a, a courthouse burns. Uh, circuit court case files, these are wonderful files, by the way. They have an enormous amount of material in them. And if you're lucky, whoever you're looking for, be it you know, you're doing research or you're doing family history or something like that, you want your family to have been scoff laws. You want them to be in court all the time way back when because then there's a good record for them. If they're good upstanding citizens and never ended up in court, you're not going to find a whole lot about them. The criminal cases, they're very juicy. Civil cases are pretty good. And it all has wonderful, uh, wonderful information in them. I've already showed you some of the U.S. Census records. There's the general census. That's what I showed you for Mr. Boyd. There's agricultural and manufacturing census as well, and those can be those. Those are wonderful resources for finding out about how much, how many crops they were producing, how much their fields were producing, manufacturing. You can go through like I could go through the manufacturing census for Shelby County and see what was being manufactured in the city of Shelbyville for 1870, 1880, that time period. Uh, Another great resource, and we have a lot of these at here at Libraries Archives, are aerial photographs. The uh, this is an aerial aerial photograph of Shelby County from the area that I've been talking about, and uh, because my eye is trained to this, I, I can already see the hedgerow I'm talking about. This is a little closer shot of it. Um, I got to kind of get my bearings. My house sits right there. The hedgerow I'm talking about is right along here. Uh, this pond that's right there, that pond is still there by the way. And this is a great big huge uh, antebellum mansion that still stands there. Uh, but I'll go to the next slide and you can see the blue line here is Burke's Branch Road, which was Birch, Burke's Branch Turnpike back in the, the 19th century. The, this blue line down here in the red line going up through here is the hedgerow. It's still there today. And, and this, this aerial photograph is from 1964. And you can see the, the tree line is not as developed. Uh, so, but it, it reveals the location of an old, old railroad. Uh, this is another shot, kind of the northern end of it. This is where the railroad crosses Burke's Branch Road. There's the blue is Burke's Branch Road. The red is the old railroad. Uh, Freedom Way, the bypass around Shelbyville, follows this line right about through there uh, today. Now, this sometimes when you're doing this type of research, you find other things. The yellow box up here, uh, it looks like the symbol for Wi-Fi. <laughs> But that's, that's an old drive-in movie theater. Like I said, this is from 1964. That theater, I was just with, just asking somebody locally about it. They told me that it closed in 1980. I didn't have time to research the drive-in. But anyway, it, it caught my eye on this aerial photograph. Uh, 
Before I get into these photographs, uh, there is one other thing that I want to share with you. A couple other things I want to share with you. Um, okay. The uh, first, I'm going to go back to the 1880 census. Here again, they have him listed as James N. Boyd, but in every other record I found in Shelby County, there is no James N. Boyd. James B. Boyd was this man's name. Uh, there he is. He's 44 years old. Farmer is what he's listed as. He had his wife, Eliza. Son, another son, Emma, who was on the previous one. And then he has, uh, living with him, Francis McClaskey and a a young boy, three years old, named Marshall McClaskey, and the M in their race, they were mulattoes. She was a cook. So that they have, you know, uh, that indicates to me that they had some means. It turns out that James V. Boyd, uh, was a, he was a stock trader. If you remember, he had a stock trader living with him 10 years prior to this. But he also uh, sold, he bought and sold um, hides. He was like a wholesaler of hides. That, that's I, again. I, I, if I was doing this research for to do to write something about, it, I would go much farther into this. But I was doing this as a it's just a demonstration. So um, here we have John C. Broadhead, 52 years old, farmer, Pennsylvania. This is the same guy that lived in Louisville in 1880. I mean, in 1870. With a little extra research, and I, I sort of already knew this, and, and this when I when I looked, when I started seeing his name pop up in some of the records in Shelby County, I was curious because being a Louisvillian and having worked at the Filson Club, I knew that John C. Broadhead had been an engineer for the Louisville and Nashville Railroad, the L and N, uh, and I thought it was curious that Mr. Broadhead was living in an area of Shelby County, listing himself as a farmer, right along near the right of way for a railroad that turned out to be the Cumberland and Ohio Railroad. That, my hedge, was the roadbed for the Cumberland and Ohio Railroad. And it turned out, with, with a little bit of research, I was able to determine that the, the CNO Railroad was um, going to connect the Ohio River to the Cumberland River so they, they could move freight. It was an effort to compete with the Cincinnati Southern Railroad, and but not compete with the L and N. It was really the L and N was. I felt like the L and N was the driving force behind the construction of this railroad. What I was able to discern. Uh, I also want to point out that instead of having his Chinese servant, Mr. Broadhead had a stonemason living with him, an, an Irish stonemason, and then down lower here, you have. Thomas Lavelle, William McGuire, John McDonald, railroad, they're, they're listed as railroad hand, railroad worker, they're all from Ireland. I was in, in 1880, they were trying to build that railroad, that is my hedge road, the Cumberland, Ohio Railroad. Uh, so, I had my answer, I, I knew that that odd little hedge road near my house was an old railroad. So one of the other great resources that's available for a lot of counties in Kentucky is a um, our old maps. I can't make that work. Nope, I hit the wrong thing. Now I got it. 1880 map. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to zoom out on this a little bit, but you can see, uh, let me get my pointer, I'll show you, this, this road right here is the Burke's Branch, in, uh, Shelbyville and Burke's Branch Turnpike. This broken line is, you can see, CNO Railroad grade. Turns out, that the CNO Railroad was only ever built between Shelbyville and Lebanon, Kentucky. I think as, 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 as much as they ever got built. I know that it was built south of Shelbyville, but not north of Shelbyville. So my hedgerow out there on 
near my house is a defunct railroad. It was never built. Uh, they 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 graded off for the railroad, but they never ever laid a single tie or rail for the railroad. It was um, they they went bust. They just ran out of money. And uh, the quick story about this is that they had cut, they had come up with a scheme to make local people pay for it by taxing them. There was a railroad tax that was enacted in Shelby County. Uh, Washington County also adopted a railroad tax, and what they were doing, it, they required people to pay this tax, and the, the, tax, the tax money was going to go into the completion of the railroad. But everybody hated the idea, so most people didn't pay the taxes, and then it became politically imprudent for any local official to try to collect the tax. So they never got their money. Down in Washington County, on this very railroad, because of the tax, local people rode out to the railroad camp and ran the railroad workers off. They, they did bodily harm to several of them. But the, the railroad was kind of doomed from the, the beginning because the l and couldn't put their money into it because I believe, if I understand railroad law from that time, that would have been illegal. Um, so they were trying, basically they were trying to shake down the taxpayers to pay for a private railroad, and it didn't work. It failed. Um, Maureen has a relevant question for the yes. She wants to know, where did you find this map that shows the railroad? Excellent question. I found it right here at the Kentucky Department for Libraries and Archives. But these maps are available everywhere. Let me pull up another um, image of that map. There's a couple things I want to point out on it. And I don't know if I got the title of the map on this one. I don't think I did. And I'm having trouble remembering. Anyway, there, there's a series of, of these maps made in the eight, late 1870s and early 1880s. Not every county had them. The way this worked was people would buy subscriptions to the map to, to, buy, you know, to buy the map. And if you paid for a subscription, they would try to put you on that map. <laughs> Uh, so your name would be on the map, and I, I, for the life of me, I, for, I just have completely forgotten the, the name of the company that did this particular map. I can find that out for you, though. Were these part of the Sanborn maps? No, these aren't these Sanborn are maps. Okay, there, there's the, there's right. one company called Beers and Company that that did these maps, and then there's another company that did this map. This one was from 1882. The Beers Company tended to do those in 1878 and 1879. And it's intermittent. Not every county has these, but they are a wonderful resource if they if they do exist. And we have them here at KDLA. Yeah, we well we have some of them at okay. KDLA. Okay. But generally, I, I find these in public libraries, uh, local historical societies. They're not a rare document by any stretch. They've been reprinted several times. But uh, on this map, you can, there's some things I want to point out. Let me get my pointer. This line right through here. Cumberland and Ohio Railroad. And you can see they actually owned a little piece of property right there. CNO Railroad Company. Uh, ran right through the middle of the street. Another thing I want to point out to you and see if I can find it right here. JV Boyd and Son. Dealers and groceries, provisions, hardware, produce, highest market, highest market pay, price paid for uh, country produce and hides. Field Seeds, a specialty, Main Street near Bank. So he had a, you know, he had a store in town, but he lived out there on the Smithfield Turnpike. Uh, so you know, you can you can find out a lot about the uh, about these people. Another one I want to point out. This is kind of off topic. Is ZZ Carpenter? He owned land. I'm going to go. I'm going to open up the other part of this map. Uh, Let me get the pointer. ZZ Carpenter. Mm -hmm. He lived out along this railroad and Burke's Branch Road. And I was out taking photographs one night and I found the ruins of Mr. Carpenter's house. So I'm gonna I'm gonna shut this one down because I don't want to open up too many of these things. So ZZ Carpenter, proprietor proprietor of stock farm, dealer and breeder of Suffolk punch horses, Cotswold sheep, and Berkshire hogs. Mm -hmm. 
uh, a punch horse, a Suffolk punch horse was a plow horse, a, a substantial horse, uh, a very docile animal. I look, looked up um, and it, consistent with the type of horses that were being braid, bred and sold in Shelby County at the time. <clears throat> but his, the ruins of his house sit out in the middle of a field. Okay, I want to see if there's anything else I want to share with them that I haven't yet. Uh, yeah, I was, shall we, I was talking about circuit court files earlier. These are my notes from circuit court. Um, I want to, thank you. That's what I was wanting to do. I went through the indexes to the circuit court files and I started, I hit a gold mine because right here, um, oh, on this one, my pointer. Sino Railroad versus E. Frazier, Shelby County Judge. This is where everything started to break down for the uh, Sino Railroad because they filed suit against Erasmus Frazier, was the man's name, uh, because he was not, as a county judge, he wasn't doing what he should be doing to collect the taxes uh, for that area. It's because Judge Frazier, a politician, and he realized that if he leaned on people to collect those taxes, he was going to get voted out of office. So he uh, had ref refused to pay, and the CNO Railroad filed suit against him. And um, they won. They forced the judge to start collecting the taxes. But he still, he didn't put his, uh, his all into it. You can see, I, I'm in my notes, I got this from the civil case file. I went through the plaintiff, the plaintiff index, the roll number. That is a microfilm roll number here at Libraries and Archives. I didn't have to go to Shelby County. I didn't have to look at the, uh, the original book. I just scrolled through the book. And now you see I made a note here, second book on roll. That's what I was looking for. Okay, that, uh, that's how you get into circuit court files. I think I have one more thing I want to share. I thought I had. Uh, I want to, sometimes when I'm doing this research, if I'm, if I'm frustrated a little bit, I just start, I'll pick up a book in a county clerk's office, an, an, an index or something like that, and try to take a different approach to finding something. And you can see this is what, and I, I call that my own term for that. This is not any kind of scholarly term or anything like that. It's tangent research. That's when I'm going through my notes, I know I was off on a tangent. And sometimes I find really good stuff by, by doing that. I might find information about an adjacent track or something like that. Um, but some of the notes you can see, I was able to determine that the um, $100,000 was set aside to construct a line from Shelbyville to Eminence, which is up in Henry County, uh, and that J.C. Beckham uh, was the president of the CNO Railroad. Uh, J.C. Beckham, I think, later became governor. Kentucky. The uh, Fox Run and Bullskin Turnpike Company, uh, these were where they were, these turnpike companies, each little road was usually its own private turnpike company. When they were creating the grade for the railroad, they had to negotiate with each turnpike company for a crossing. So that's what I was able to find just by going off on a tangent, looking for things about this railroad. Once I had the name of the railroad, I had a whole different way to do the research. Uh, the Researching the deeds took me back to the name of that railroad, and that opens the door for me to start searching a whole bunch of other things for the, the name of that railroad. Cumberland and Ohio Railroad, C&O Railroad, and in the indexes, it'll be listed a whole bunch of different ways. It'll be under railroad, Cumberland and Ohio. Cumberland, Ohio Railroad, CNO Railroad. Uh, you know, so if you get into this type of research, don't think too narrowly. 
just go after it. Go start looking for, you know, once you have a name, start looking for variations of that name. Oh, I want to I shut that one down. And I'm going to shut that one down too. So, the photograph you're looking at is a modern photograph of the CNO Railroad north of Shelbyville. This area right here, this swale right here, is the old roadbed for that railroad. The trees above it are the hedge that I spotted uh, back in the fall a, a year ago, a little more, I mean, a little less than a year ago, uh, out just walking with my kids. That's my daughter standing down in that same swale that I photographed. You can see how deep it is. I just I had her out there. She was carrying my camera equipment for me. And uh, I would send her down there to give some perspective about how deep it was. You can, you can tell by her body language how, how enthused she was at doing that. This is another angle of it. That's my daughter standing down in the swale of the old railroad. That This out here is the bypass around Shelbyville. Kentucky 55 uh, and then back to the uh, some of the Google Maps you know this is part of the, the hedge line that piqued my curiosity and the two arrows show where I was standing when I took this photograph and this is just out in the in the field now it was when I was taking this photograph when I discovered the ruins of ZZ Carpenter's house out in the same field. I didn't include any of that in this presentation. That, that's for another, that's another research project. And today, these are modern photographs. I mean, we've just taken back in uh, June. This is the, the CNO Railroad going through Shelbyville, Kentucky, which is now used, it's no longer the CNO, and they only use a small segment of the old railroad that connects the CSX line, which is on the north side of Shelbyville, to the Southern Railway, which is on the southern side of Shelbyville. I guess when they move freight cars from one railroad to another, I don't know how that works business-wise, but I know that they do shuttle freight between two competing railroads. Uh, they use this line to move that freight, and they do it in the middle of the night. So if you're ever driving through Shelbyville, you might be surprised you find a train just sitting right there in the middle of the road. Uh, and you just got to wait for them to, to, to move it. The house, that house sits on the property on that 1882 map that is designated Cumberland, Ohio Railroad. I don't know if that house was built by the Cumberland, Ohio Railroad. I, I just I haven't been able to, to piece that together. So, uh, and that really brings me to the end of my present presentation. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to give me, to contact me here at Libraries and Archives. You can see my phone number. Uh, the first one, oh, the first one is my office phone here at Libraries and Archives. Uh, because of the nature of the local records program, I'm often out on the road working with one of my regional administrators, so I carry a cell phone. That's how you can reach me if you can't reach me at the office, and that is my email address. And you're welcome to uh, contact me with any questions. Or, you know, if you're working on something, I might be able to advise you on how to, how to go about doing your research. So I really appreciate your all's time. I was excited about talking to uh, librarians throughout the state. I'm always up for talking about part of Kentucky history. I always look at it kind of backwards. I look at it from the small and then they try to expand it out to the large. Thank you, Trace. Just as uh, housekeeping real quick, um, I will be working on your certificates first thing next week. You'll receive your certificate and your survey for today's class. Please make sure to fill those out. Trace and I are going to stick around for a few more minutes if you think of any questions, and have a good Friday. Thanks, everyone.